I was looking for more. Uh, and I, I wanted this to show so well, but it, it left me hungry. Rogue Games put the call out to find their next big game and indie developers around the world answered. There are five different categories and five chances to win. But before they can get the glory, they'll have to impress Rogue's hand-picked industry heavyweights, AKA our judges. I do think the control timing for the tricks was off a little bit, right? It didn't always work and the visual language wasn't there yet to tell you when you actually nailed something. Who will take their idea to the next level and go Rogue? It's anyone's game. I don't know about you guys, but I think this one has it. Today, our judges will be choosing the best overall game and the winner will not only be taking home half a million dollars in prize money, Rogue Games will also offer them a publishing deal. That's a big deal, literally. After much deliberation, our judges are excited to announce... This is Rogue Jam. Welcome to Rogue Jam. Rogue Games is dedicated to putting great indie titles in the hands of players. They're on the lookout to discover their next big game and the competition is heating up. With giant cash prizes and the chance to get their games published by Rogue, things are about to get crazy for these game developers. To up the ante, we brought together a panel of industry experts to help decide who wins and who is going home, even if most of them are home already. Let's meet the judges. When Reggie fils isn't kicking ass or taking names, he's writing books and hosting lectures about video games. Oh, and he used to be the president of a little video game company called Nintendo. Per Schneider is executive vice president, chief content officer, and co-founder of IGN Entertainment. If he gets any more job titles, IGN will legally be required to rank them all in a top 10 list. Matt Casamassina helped to co-found IGN Entertainment back in the glory days of the Nintendo 64. These days, he's the co-founder and CEO of Rogue. After working on games like Halo, Age of Empires, and Need for Speed, and co-founding InMass Entertainment, Christopher Lee is now the GM for Xbox's publisher strategy and marketing team. Kimberly Porter Corbett works at Warner Brothers Games as the company's senior vice president of digital publishing. If you've gotten your butt kicked in a Mortal Kombat game recently, you can thank Kimberly for helping to make that happen. And finally, Chris Archer is the Chief Strategy Officer of Rogue, and his teams have helped to release over 100 games. And today on Rogue Jam, he might help that number get even larger. So as mentioned, we are crying the best overall game submitted to Rogue Jam. This is undoubtedly the most difficult category to narrow down, and it's got the most at stake. Before we take a look at our semifinalists, let's check in with our judges. Reggie, you oversaw the launch of a mountain of Nintendo games that were critical darlings, fan favorites, and massive commercial success. What's the secret sauce to a great game? To me, the game has to play great. It's all about the gameplay, right? I think that's the key for any great game. Matt, you're the CEO of Rogue Games. What does a game need to do to make you want to scoop it up and publish it besides winning Rogue Jam? Yeah, generally look for weird and wonderful games. Uh, in this category, polish does play a big part and I would say innovation as well. All right, well, let's get things started. Here are the Rogue Jam nominees in the overall category brought to you by AWS Game Tech. Let the games begin. While I was studying biomedical engineering in college, all my open-end projects ended up converging into some form of game. The name of our game is Beers, Beers and Boomerangs. Boomerangs. You have to multitask between cooking for your friends while you have to survive against Australian animals that are trying to ruin your barbecue. I started teaching myself how to make games uh, solo. The name of the game is Fade the First Chapter. Fade is about a spirit trying to reclaim the shards of this weapon its power has been sealed into and the player is resurrected to help this spirit try to recover all these shards. As a kid I found myself saying, how'd they do that? That curiosity carried all the way into my adulthood. To this day I can still play a game and go, how'd they do that? Our game is called Sea Dog. We like to tell people it's a skateboarding metroidvania without skateboards. Hello. I am Atanas, and I am part of the Moolander dev team. Our game is called Moolander. It is about aliens trying to abduct cows. However, the catch is the cows fight back. Hi everyone, I'm Nikolai. I'm a 3D designer. Our game is called Daydream. It's an adventure platformer with puzzle elements. The visual style of Daydream is cartoony for both kids and adults to enjoy. I'm a self-taught game developer, so I don't really have a background in games. Worlds of the Future, it's an action uh, adventure game. Being able to land on planets with no loading screens at all, going on adventures with your crew, as well as running into colorful characters, uh, alien creatures, and mysteries around the open world. 
Final Fantasy VII was the first game that I really had this explosive emotional connection. Right after that point, I realized that I really, really want to be a part of making games. The name of our game is Spectre. In Spectre, you play as, as two different teams. Basically, the Spectres go in, they try to hack the computers, and the Reapers essentially try to stop them. The name of our game is Die For Us. It is a four-player cooperative zombie game heavily focused on teamwork. The gameplay entails players taking on the role of one of the four main characters in this apocalyptic overrun world of hordes of infected in order to get to safety. I want to create games because I want to provide that experience, that really cool gut feeling, all the reasons why people keep coming back to games. Finally, this is an opportunity to show migration to the whole world. I hope we can make an experience that really inspires them and make a positive impact on them. Most of my relatives are a little bit like, so when are you getting your real job again? We just want to be part of the next generation stories. Well, anytime you drop half a million dollars, competition will be fierce and naturally not every game you just saw can make it into our finalist round. But before we reveal those, we're highlighting a rogue standout brought to you by Galaxy Racer. Matt Casamassina, why don't you tell us about a game that didn't quite make the cut? Sure, yeah, there's a game called Misplaced, which uh, I think if you look at it, you'll see some inspirations there from Zelda, and in particular, Link's Awakening. Uh, it's got this really lovely presentation. If you sit down and play it, which sadly not everybody can do just yet, but we were lucky enough to, has great controls, everything's very responsive and fluid. And I think the only thing it's missing right now uh, is that tilt shift, depth of field blur that would really bring that together and it would just be Zelda at that point. That's the main reason we didn't pick it is because it is so inspired by Zelda that we really want to see a differentiator going forward. Now let's take a closer look at the first of our finalists, a skateboarding Metroidvania that doesn't have skateboards or Metroids. It makes more sense when you see it in action. Let's take a look at Sea Dog. Hello, my name is Tyler Maitland. I'm with Oh My Me Games from Washington State and the name of our game is Sea Dog. Sea Dog is a Metroidvania skateboarding hybrid game uh, without the skateboards. You play as a mechanic who grinds around on their giant wrench inside these large ships, digging through the holes and unlocking upgrades. You are thrown into a large sea hole in the middle of the ocean with all these odd characters that seem to be mysteriously okay about being there and uh, you have to get out. So I grew up in Arizona. Um, before I came to Washington State and uh, my father was a mechanic and maybe there's some subconsciousness there with the main character being a mechanic. Uh, I was always helping him in the garage. Uh, I was always around tools uh, and my father can attest to this. I was terrible with my hands and I as a kid really clicked with computers and video games are always kind of my outlet. You know, balancing uh, a healthy marriage and raising two boys and and trying to give as much of myself as possible to this game, to build this vision, to try to sell it to somebody, uh, it's definitely the hardest thing I've ever had to do. For a while there, it was pretty hard. It was pretty hit and miss. Um, you know, play testing's not going well, and you just, it's, <laughs> everybody's kind of looking around and you're like, no, we gotta stick with it, gotta stick with it. And we're getting more and more confident and making it to this final stage uh, in this contest is definitely reassuring and, and brought some real life uh, to us in development. And um, it's, starting to, it's starting to really make it worthwhile. Now we've seen lots of Metroidvania games, lots of skateboarding games, and lots of games about pirates, but not too many games that are a mix of all three. Until now. Joining us from Port Townsend, Washington, please welcome Tyler Maitland from Oh My Me Games, creator of Sea Dog. Welcome. Hi, thank you for having me. All right, Tyler, our judges have all had time to play Sea Dog and have both feedback and questions for you. Let's start with my favorite landlubber, Chris Lee. I played through the entire demo, had some fun nostalgic moments that kind of brought me back to that uh, Jet Set Radio kind of vibe of grinding. And I fell in love with your characters. They've got uh, great silhouettes, they've got great personality, and they've got a good dynamic between the two. So I made it to the end of the demo and I really want to know what happens next. Once we get funding, we want to build out a first ship that's a little easier to get the player into. And one of the first things you do is you end up grabbing a gear that you bring back to your ship and you unlock the cannon to be able to shoot 360 degrees around you. And that unlocks, through a very Metrovanian fashion, two fresh new ships that the player can go over to. I really enjoyed playing the game. As I would go through, and I don't know if it was user error or just some of the uh, challenges with the controls, but... 
Rogue Jam is presented by NPD. As I would go through, and I don't know if it was user error or just some of the uh, challenges with the controls, but I found myself in places where I just wasn't getting the timing right. I wasn't managing to, to project myself to where I needed to be. I'd love to get you to talk a little bit about the controls, what you're envisioning doing the controls, how you would continue tightening the controls. Uh, the game has already changed quite a bit in the last two and a half months, and we've been working on this quite complex character controller that constantly goes back and forth from like, I'm platforming and I'm grinding and now I'm spinning on bolts and these state machines. I'm not gonna lie, there's still some kinks to, to work out, especially with like leaving a bolt and the expectations of players leaving the bolts um, and making sure that's like 100% locked down. You gotta have a kick-ass soundtrack for this game. So please invest in that if you're not already. Bring in a really smart, funny writer and just nail the dialogue. I'd say work on your visual language. When I first started playing, I approached the bolts from a kind of righty-tighty, lefty-loosey perspective, but it needs to be very obvious to me as a player. And I do love the idea of like, if water is coming out of a bolt, that righty-tighty like closes it. Um, so think about like how you teach the, the player about these things. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, Tyler. We're going to send you back to our virtual green room for a bit while we confer with our judges. So see ya, dog. It was really cool seeing seeing their reactions to the game uh that you know you sit and sit in a desk and you just work away all by yourself or with a small team and then you kind of just put this thing out there and people are responding to it which feels really good well judges what do we think let's start with you archer i don't know about you guys but i think this one has it like it actually like i was really drawn to it um it really was a great uh, genre blend. Yeah, I like this lo-fi style that they've got going, and that's gonna work across the spectrum, so whether you're on PlayStation 5 or Switch, it's gonna play well and, and run well. And I think it has this very distinct look that people, you look at it immediately, you're like, oh, that's different. I haven't seen quite like that before. So I'm excited to see where they take it. It's a game that could really benefit from a slow onboarding process. And I, th I do think the control timing for the tricks was off a little bit, right? It didn't always work and the visual language wasn't there yet to tell you when you actually nailed something. I felt that the promise was there, that that would be cleaned up. And the thing I really like about this game is how organic the pieces kind of flow and how it all fits together. I wish we would have gotten to play the game you know, that they've been working on for three more months. Yeah. Because m my frustration was when I wasn't hitting those speeds and those angles and those elements and I would fail, it was incredibly frustrating. And and t to me, they've already recognized that they've been working on it for another three months and they've, they've made it even more tight. Sorry, I was gonna say that's really important for a game like this too because it has that broad appeal. Anybody would want to pick this up and play it, and if you don't nail the tutorial, you just get immediate bounds. All right, well, we'll see how Sea Dog fares against the competition. Our next finalist is a dungeon crawling fantasy, Fade the First Chapter. Take a look. Hi, I'm Houston Holmes. Um, I'm the creator of Fade the First Chapter, a third person uh, action adventure Souls like game. Fade is essentially a third-person action RPG focused around exploration and fighting against different enemies to essentially try to recover these shards in order to bring back power to the creature that's giving you life. I like the feeling of achievement when I was playing Dark Souls for the first time, when I played the first Dark Souls back when it first released, and I really wanted to create that to have a game that's also challenging but also has the option for you to make your life easier by exploring. I was taking a hiatus from school because I didn't want to take out student loans again. So essentially I was back in my hometown. I was kind of like a little bit like, you know, not really the happiest about it, but I was like using the time to work on my ideas and teach myself how to work on the game better back then. And out of nowhere, on my way to work, the rain came down so heavy. I started spinning out of control and hydroplaning. I, I, could, I could feel, I was like, I have no control over this. And I felt a calmness about it and that scared me. I realized that I was really unhappy where I was, and that fixated me on a goal to basically become more independent so I could get out of my hometown, uh, work on this more often, and really make this dream become a reality. If I had basically actually passed away that day when that accident happened, and I had never gotten this far, I just wouldn't be happy with it. Sinking hundreds of hours into epic fantasy RPGs is how plenty of us spend our time, but our next guest took it one step further and started making his own. 
Joining us from Roanoke, Virginia is Houston M. Gwyn Holmes from Night by Night Games, the one-man dev team behind Fade the First Chapter. Welcome and hello. Thanks for having me. Okay, Houston, what has 12 legs and a ton of feedback and questions about Fade? That's right, it's our judges. Houston, great to meet you. Uh, this game is right up my alley. The, the piece that I need you to answer for me is to clear up a question because in all of the material, it framed it as being a multiplayer type of experience. And yet what we play, it seems it's gonna be more of a single player experience with NPCs. So just help me understand exactly what your vision is. Early on in development, I wanted to try to do multiplayer, but essentially I wanted to make sure that everything was perfect in terms of the combat system and different features since I'm working on it solo. Definitely for now, I kinda wanna focus on it being a single player experience to make sure it's all just one you know, really solid product. I clearly didn't do my homework. I was for sure this game was developed by 20 to 30 people. I'm just blown away that this has just been a labor of love for you and uh, a passion project and I, it, you can feel it come through the gameplay. I'm looking forward to watching your career over the next few years because if this is any indication, you're going places and it's, it's gonna be amazing. My question's like, you've got so much of it figured out when, and it's come together really nicely. What's been the most challenging part of the development process for you? I would say putting the game in early access, mainly just to like see people's opinion on different like facets of the game, because it's helped me like come up with a lot of new ideas for things I can improve on. The only thing I might focus on is how do you make this game sort of stand apart from other games like it? The only thing I might focus on is how do you make this game sort of stand apart from other games like it? You talked a little bit about that, but really what differentiates it from other products like it on the market? You are clearly multi-talented, man. I mean, writing, coding, visual design, audio, this, is, this looks so good. The one area where I think you could, could use a little help from, a, from an external source, a consultant would be on the UX and UI front. So the menu systems for games like this, deep games like this can become very complex, very complicated and occasionally obtuse and it'll be difficult for people to get sucked in and navigate. And so there are people who specialize in that and if you get the funding, maybe you can find a consultant and have them take a look and, and help you a little bit. In the beginning, it's a little slow. You know, I think it kind of drags out a little bit and it's also a little confusing. You know, my advice would be to kind of refine that, take a few passes on it. I'd also look and seek feedback on are people understanding what that narrative is and if you, if you can smooth that out in some ways. All right, well thanks so much Houston. I'm going to ask you to fade back into cyberspace for a minute so we can confer with our judges. You know, hearing all those stuff they had to say was definitely a positive, like inspiring, you know, inspiring thing to kind of keep me going forward with the uh, development. Well judges, what do we think? Archer, let's start with you. Obviously, it's very, very impressive what Houston has done on his own. Are you confident he can really bring this thing home all by himself? No question. It's so impressive that he's done this by himself. But I don't want us to get too off track with being so impressed that he's done it by himself. Because there's a lot of elements in the game that need polish. I really enjoyed my, my playtime with this, but there's definitely things that we can, we can poke at. It's a crowded category. What's going to be the thing that as a player you say, wow, I just can't put this down. It's taken over my brain. I'm putting tens, hundreds of hours into it. You're saying the, the space is crowded, which is true. Everybody wants to make a game like this, um, but he's got a head start. He's already got this in early access. He's getting feedback from lots of players and it's doing quite well, I think, in early access as well. And so I think that makes this game very, very promising outside of the gameplay and hitting the genre beats and all of that. Every once in a while you see somebody doing what they were like clearly meant in life to be doing. And I think we just witnessed that, like, wow, you are a game maker. This is exciting. Okay, that was Fade the First Chapter, AKA Fade the Second Finalist. This next one foregoes crawling in dungeons for exploring the reaches of outer space. Here's your look at Worlds of the Future. Hello, my name is Mark and I live in Denmark, Copenhagen. Um, I'm a self-taught indie game developer and I'm working on uh, Worlds of the Future. Worlds of the Future is um, an open world space adventure game um, set in our own solar system in the year 2500. It's a game where you have your own uh, and build your own space delivery company and go on uh, cool adventures uh, around the worlds in the solar system. And you meet the uh, colorful characters along the way. 
uh, who uh, has all kind of adventures you can, uh, uh, you know, explore. So the way I balance uh, game development with, you know, other responsibilities is definitely something I had to learn. Um, luckily, at the moment, I'm working full time on the game, so I can dedicate a lot of time to it. Uh, you still have to kind of balance it with uh, with other things uh, when you're working for yourself because there's not anyone who says you have to work from this time to this time so you you have to kind of structure it a little bit all, all the time I question is it uh, is it is it worth all all the effort I put into it but um, just being part of a show like this has um, definitely got, made it made it all worth worth it for me. That was the open space sci-fi action adventure Worlds of the Future. Here to tell us more is Mark Damgard from Moonman Games, joining us all the way from Denmark. Welcome. Thanks, thanks so much. I'm glad to be here. All right, Mark, our judges have had some hands-on time with Worlds of the Future and they have questions for you. Hey Mark, tell me about how you're designing these worlds. Is this procedural or are you guys creating these bespoke, like you're actually designing the levels? Yeah, uh, so it's actually like a mix of procedural generation and handcrafting. Um, so because it's set within our solar system, we have, uh, you know, the ability to do these unique locations. You've got bridge control, you've got space exploration, you have ground battles. Which one of these three elements do you feel needs the most improvement and you want to focus your time on? We are working with our narrative designer to flesh out um, a story mission in the game. So that will, you know, bring the player more into this world, the, the lore in the world, as well as, um, you know, connect to the to the characters. So Mark, you know, thanks for the opportunity to spend some time with your game. I really enjoyed it, but... So Mark, you know, thanks for the opportunity to spend some time with your game. I really enjoyed it, but... What I'm really interested in is the progression and the rewards for the player, meaning after I've done a mission, once I've, I've delivered my cargo, what's the motivation to keep playing, to do the next mission? Help me understand how you're thinking about that part of the game. The idea is, of course, the player uh, is starting and, and growing their own space delivery company. Um, and trying to climb to the top of the leaderboard of companies within the solar system. Everything we're doing is really trying to, uh, you know, make the world feel like, you know, you're part of a world that exists, uh, not just because of you, you're not just there, but there's stuff going on and you can make an impact, you can, you can uh, change things. Uh, so uh, that's also why we have a karma system. Uh, you know, which um, we, we try to try to make the player kind of make a positive impact on the world. Hi, Mark. Um, I love the positive Hi. angle of this game. That was super refreshing. I think we all could use a little positivity right now. That was great. Yeah. <laughs> Look, this game is ambitious. How are you thinking about finding bugs, QA, that side of, of sort of managing your game. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. So far, we haven't done a whole lot of group testing. Uh, and I think this also shows a little bit in, in, in the demo. So, so that's definitely something we are looking to do going forward. Uh, there is definitely a lot of potential for bugs in, in an open world game where yeah. there's you know, so much uh, uh, freedom given to the player. But, you know, we're also trying to take a simple approach through the systems and the mechanics that we're creating. Market timing is really important. You've been in development for a while, and the reality is is you want to have contextual relevance with the other games that are out there, and you know the taste and the preferences of players are changing. Video game industry itself is the most dynamic and fast-paced, so I'd really encourage you to look at ways that you perhaps can accelerate development. You must test your game, you know, start with focus testing, but you, this needs to go big, so work with a partner get them to thoroughly test this game because the things we didn't like happened to be bugs as we played through this. Yeah. And so those when you're delivering this to the consumer, that's the first thing they notice. It's such a wonderful, ambitious project. You don't want it to be marred with bugs for sure. All right, thank you very much, Mark. We'll be catching back up with you in just a bit. I, I was definitely very nervous, but, uh, but I really, I really, uh was kind of like starstruck a little bit as well, just talking to Reggie and, and these other 
industry veterans. Um, so, but it, it was super great to hear uh, their thoughts on the game, and uh, I hope I, I was able to give some uh, some okay answers as well. What did you think of Worlds of the Future, Reggie? This developer, this team has put their heart and soul into this for years and years and years. It is incredibly ambitious. You know, I, I have to say, for me, this was not you know, my most fun experience in playing the game. And it's because I, I am a completionist by nature. I want to do all the nooks and crannies. I want to be rewarded for that. I didn't feel that way as I played through the game. So I, I, uh, I was looking for more. I love the scope. I love the fact that you can go from bridge to shuttle, from shuttle to planet. All of that is so good. I think the, the combat still feels a little clunky. Um, but I think you can iron it out. I think the, the framework is there, the world is there. I really like being in that world. I love all the systems, and now it, it needs to be tweaked probably for another year for sure. At least, yeah, yeah and I have a confession to yeah. make. I, I have followed Worlds of the Future for more than a year already with yeah. hearts in my eyes. Like, I've really loved this game for a long time, and this is the beginning. So if we were to take this game and fast forward three years with a proper dev budget, and some guidance, this could be could be huge. Yep. Yeah, I think that, you know, when you make it the color scheme and, and the happy sort of perspective, I love that too. It makes it broader. And then I think you need to work on the accessibility because it is so complex. But the biz I couldn't get the business person in me out of my head where you said with proper budget, yeah. I run QA on an open world that can get pretty expensive. <laughs> so, I mean, I think just yeah. being really, that's why I was like, really focus on what you're doing next because so ambitious and awesome, but really careful about the investment. Now that our judges have narrowed our submissions down to three finalists and cross-examined the developers, it's time for the hard part, picking just one winner. Then the even harder part, handing over half a million dollars. But first, we want to take a moment to thank our sponsor, AWS Game Tech, for offering their support and providing an opportunity for all Rogue Jam participants in receiving up to $10,000 in AWS promotional credits. These credits help developers of all sizes build faster, run operationally smarter, and grow fun, innovative games. And if you're feeling a little inspired to develop your own game or are thinking about moving to the cloud, game developers can apply for AWS promotional credits to help you build the game of your dreams. AWS behind great games, there's game tech. And with that, the votes are ready to be cast and soon one of these three games will take home the gold cup, the grand prize package, the big deal, and the dough, the whole enchilada, the jumbo sized plate of onion rings, but enough about my lunch. Let's invite our developers back on for the final reveal from Rogue CEO, Matt Casamassina, after the break. We come to it at last, the great battle of our time. We'll now reveal the overall Rogue Jam winner and recipient of half a million dollars and a publishing deal with Rogue Games. Now since Matt is officially the big boss at Rogue, he will be speaking on behalf of the judges. Matt, have you reached a decision? Well, I gotta tell you, this one was tough, but we have a decision. All right, then let's bring our developers back and get down to business. Developers, are you ready? Yes. yes. Matt, the floor is yours. <laughs> okay, first up, let's start with Tyler. Sea Dog is a cool hybrid concept. We love this combination of Metroidvania meets Tony Hawk. It's an incredibly fresh idea. It plays really great for the most part, but some of us did struggle with the grind and trick systems early on. Love the style, there's a ton of promise here, and can't wait to see how it develops. Houston. Fade is awesome. The game is incredibly fun, controls extremely well, and looks absolutely gorgeous. Can't believe this is coming from a one-person effort. It feels like it should be a studio project. The only downside, it's very familiar, and it wears its inspirations on its sleeves. So we'd love to see it stand out on its own going forward. And finally, Mark. Worlds of the Future is more than just an open world. It lets players explore an entire solar system at one-fifth scale. It's pretty impressive. It feels like No Man's Sky meets Futurama with its utopian universe. Incredibly ambitious all around. But it does need polish, especially in the areas of tutorial and the UI UX. Lots of games are set in space, but Worlds of the Future really sets itself apart with a great, unique style. All three of these titles are amazing, and we have no doubt they're going to be epic things in store for each one of these talented creators. 
But we can only pick one winner. And the first ever Rogue Jam overall grand prize winner is... Sea Dog. Thank you guys so much. Talking about a lot of forwards right now, to be honest with you. Congratulations, Tyler. Sea Dog has <laughs> rocked the boat and scored the Rogue overall prize. You just won half a million dollars in a Rogue My publishing God. deal. I know you're just saying you're, you're finding a hard time coming up with the words to describe how you're feeling right now, but give it a shot. Uh, yeah, grateful. I mean, uh, like I said, this was a long shot for us, and and to be in, in finalist was was great. And I definitely got to thank Travis and Mario, my two programmers, uh, all the play testers, and people who helped work on the game. Um, my wife Natalie, she uh, uh, supported me through the whole thing and allowed me to kind of break away and try this try this this thing and. Uh, I want to thank uh, Chris Graham, who was the owner of Grumpy Face Studios, and I kind of see him as a mentor, and if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be making games. And uh, thank you, Rogue and IGN, for putting this whole thing together, and uh, wow, came a long ways. How does winning this prize money change the trajectory of Sea Dog and of your life? I'm going to Disneyland, so, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 we were trying to put together budgets for the game and this is over our budget. So we're going to be able to put even more effort and love and content into the game, um, which is really cool. And, uh, you know, collecting that paycheck is going to help. So. <laughs> Judges, any final words for Tyler here? There are dozens of new games coming out every day. And, you know, you hooked us with something that looked and felt different and really you know, just got us to think positively about video games and video game development. So thank you for that and hope you crack open a, a bottle of champagne with your wife today. I personally can't wait to play these new builds that you talked about earlier. I'm excited about that and I know Matt and I are really excited to uh, partner up with you and, uh, and get, get this thing to the next level. This game really just won us over. We love it. It's so charming, dude. Uh, I just want to let you know we've got a great studio team that's going to be working with you every step of the way to take this thing to the next level. And um, let's make this a game that you know people are talking about in five years. Oh, it's amazing. Thank you, guys. Well, congratulations again, Tyler. That wraps things up for us here in the studio today. A huge thank you to our judges and all the participating developers. I'm Damon Hatfield, and on behalf of everyone here at Rogue Jam, we'll see you next time. Tune in next week to see which of our feature games that you, the fans, voted as your audience choice finalists. And watch our judges pit the three nominees against each other and give away $50,000 to one lucky winner. If you gave them the money and they partnered with Rogue, they could really go somewhere with it. Tune in to IGN on Monday, May 16th to find out who's got the most fantastic game. Rogue Jam. It's anyone's game.